Well, hi everybody. My name's Bob Cartwright and I'm a stove addict. Welcome, fellow stove lovers, wherever you may be watching, to a little humble little collection of mine of one or two stoves that I've gathered together, used, sold, bought back again, and uh, so on over the years. I uh, just want to say welcome everybody. Welcome everybody that's in the chat room. I can see there's a few famous faces in there, well from my point of view anyway. Richard Barnes, hi in Doncaster. Welcome Richard. Uh, Pete Varley, hi Lilo, nice to see you again. And Stormy Norman's here from Norm Storming Stoves and we'll be touching on a couple of Storming Stoves shortly. Uh, Andrew Choffin, chilling and waiting. Nice to see you Andrew. Uh, Cheshire Wanderer on uh, YouTube. And that's about it coming in at the moment. Anyway, so do join in and, and say hi. This is a very informal meander through a handful of, uh, well, a bit more than a handful, handful of stoves. If you see anything uh, in here that you would like to know a bit more information about, you want me to weigh it, I've got a set of scales here and I can weigh it for you and show it to you in detail uh, as we go through. But I just thought I'd meander through this collection. I'll start with the alcohol stoves move on to the gas stoves, and then the ones that really excite me, which are the multi-fuel stroke wood stoves. If you're watching this in the future, welcome, and please do subscribe to the channel. There's lots of interesting interviews and uh, content coming over the next few weeks, and I'm trying to basically create a, a channel that's got a whole variety of content suitable for people interested in self-powered travel and the outdoors. And there's nothing nicer than a little bit of cooking, is there really? So let's kick it off with this nice delectation we've got for you here. And as I say, Rose is sitting in the chat room. Hang a second. Rose can give you a wave. Wave to the camera, Rosie. And she's, oh, you're being quiet again today. You're joining in? Well, I'm joining in. I'm, I just like to say I'm shocked Now you've got all your stoves out. These obviously hoard, been hoarding these away and, and not letting me see like... Uh, like uh, me when I'm um, saying this, what this old dress I've had it in the wardrobe for ages. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, if it works, don't don't change the system. Uh, so back to uh, back to my table of fun. Um, as I say, we are. I'm waiting for people to to pipe in with any comments and uh, so on as we as we go through. But I thought I'd start with the the smallest and the lightest which is this um, Tibetan, not Tibetan, what do they call themselves now? King Sound. King Sound Esbit uh, stove. Let's just zoom in a bit closer for this one, which is, uh, where's the middle of the picture? The middle of the picture is about there. Okay, let's move that out of the way. Which is as simple as they get. I think it's, uh, it's about, let's have a quick look actually. Put it on the scales, about 18 grams, 14 grams. 14 grams, can you see the scales? Just, let's bring that into the picture a bit more. So 14 grams on, the, uh, on that as a basic stove. And what people tend to do when they've got this is you need a pot that's uh, about a 700 mil or larger pot to sit on the prongs. Uh, rotate it so you can see that. Sit on the prongs there. And uh, you just have the usual Esbit hexamine tablets to, to get kick off. And obviously it makes sense to have a windshield. So one of the many flexible windshields you can get, the thin foil ones, ones like these ones, if you can find them, uh, but if not, then the Vargo folding windshield is very popular. I think there was a picture of that in the introduction. Uh, well, weight-wise, it's very difficult to know what's next. Probably this lovely little white box stove. Now, this is made by a chap in America 
uh, called Bill Ballou, would you believe? Yeah, that's genuinely his name. And it's made from aluminium beer bottles that he finds discarded by the roadside. And he polishes them all up, does his clever little inversion of the neck inside the side of the, of the, of the pot there. And it's a compression alcohol stove. And by that, what I mean is that the alcohol, the meths goes into that little ridge that's there. That's as deep as it needs to be. Uh, you light the alcohol, you wait for it to bloom. And when it blooms, where's my, my forwards and backs, the opposite way around. That's tricky, this. There we go. Uh, when it blooms, the flames come out the, these holes at the side. And you need a pot a, no smaller than the old Titan kettle here to sit on it. And that puts pressurizes this section here because obviously it seals it completely. It pressurizes it and it makes the flames jet around the outside. And that then uh, obviously heats the, uh, the water, heats the, the pan that you've got on it. I tend to find um, it comes with a, with a, a windshield, which is quite nice, a little uh, very thin foil windshield, which is a good one. Uh, and that tends to wrap around most pots quite happily. The negative, if there was a negative on this one, is because the diameter of this, this base is so narrow, um, it, with a weight of you know, oh, 750 grams of liquid or food in there, you've got to make sure it's dead flat. Uh, otherwise, it can, if you don't put it on central, it can tip up. So that's the, the sort of be aware of type comment I'd make with this one. But as regards an efficient burner, uh, when they, uh, we send these out, uh, we tend to tell people to watch their eyebrows because once they burn, they really do burn. And the other way or association it can work really well is actually inside um, the honey stove because the honey stove is just the right diameter and it reflects all the heat and really does concentrate the heat up. So for a powerful little burner, which is 32 grams, um, it's not bad at all. Um, then we probably come on to the siphon stove. Uh, this is one again by King Sound. Um, and a very nice little unit, this extremely light. Let's just have a look at the weight of this one uh, 20 grams. It's actually King Sound have turn, turn, turn their, changed their name to Tokes. Oh, Tokes, sorry, that's right. Um, See, it's nice to have an adjudicator in there, isn't it? Uh, shallower in, in height than the white box, uh, but I find this is a lovely little stove, and also it has the advantage, unlike the white box, if you um, put your fuel in and it's burned, it doesn't, your, your, your pan doesn't sit directly on top of this one. This one has a, a height of about 30 mil, I think it is, 34 mil, above the rim to get the maximum heat out of it. But if you can manage to extinguish it, you can actually drizzle the uh, alcohol, the remaining alcohol, out of it back into your container. So it makes it a nice little stove. And as I say, it's a titanium stove as well, so it's extremely rugged. Let us move on to Vargo, Brian Vargo. Nice chap, Brian Vargo, over in the States. Lovely guy, and he's been, um, uh, met him a few times, interviewed him a few times, and he's been designing stoves really for about as, as long as I've been using them, about 15, 20 years now. Uh, and the Triad stove's quite a unique multifunction stove, and probably when this first came out in about 2006, 2007, this was probably very, very unique, and in some respects still is. Um, he, so it's, so alcohol in the top, alcohol of meths in the top and you fill it until there you can't quite see it I think you can I can see it on the on the monitor here there's a little dark ring there that's where I've used it before and the stain of the uh, methylated spirits has got to that puddle so you create a puddle in there you light it and again two or three minutes it blooms and all the the jets come out of the holes here and then you place your pot on top obviously windshield is a great help as well the prongs are quite nice and they sense that they keep your pan at the right height. The negative side, as you can imagine straight away, is that with a mug type sized base pot, uh, then it, it can slip off very easily. And they're not ribbed either, they're quite smooth. So you have to make sure you've got a bigger pan really and it will stay on there nicely. But the other um, little uh, feature when it's this way up is that the other three prongs 
push down into the ground. So unlike the white box, this has got a sort of a certain amount of stability built in, which is quite nice. But then the second advantage to this is you can flip it over and use that as a hexamine or um, esbit tablet base. And um, that will, if you're like that type of fuel, I'm not mad on that type of fuel. It smells and I always make a mess with it and it never seems to cook particularly well from my point of view. But if you're into hexamine, esbit tablets, it'll sit on there and the same principle applies, put a windshield around it. So that's quite sweet. He has done another one called the uh, Triad XE. That one's just the basic Triad. The Triad XE is 50 grams. And again, he's gone into the multi um, facility, multi, multi faceted. What's the word I'm looking for, Rose? Multi something or other. Um, so that would be for Esbit tablets again should you wish to do so. Again, same principle with the prongs that sit into the ground, give it lots of stability, which is, which is good. Let's move that out of the way so we've got more space. Where are we? Uh, there. Um, which is good. And then you've got this sort of sealed container and that comes apart and inside there you can put your gel or alcohol again, methylated spirits and light it and it blooms. Um, uh, I think the, the, what you have to do is you have to put a little puddle of alcohol in the bottom of this first and light that and drop that in and that then heats up the mess that are inside it and that then vaporizes the mess and then obviously action stations. So uh, once again, double pronged event and you can pop it in that way around should you wish to do so and put hexamine esbit tablets on top if you're not getting enough air through these holes. So that's quite a nifty little one. My preference to be to be honest, I say preference, I've used, I, I like the triad. The one thing I like about alcohol stoves is silence. So if you do enjoy sitting there waiting for your food to uh, heat up and there's no particular rush and the silence of it all, the alcohol stoves certainly certainly work really well. Uh, let's go on to another Brian Vargo. Um, this is actually exactly the same principle as the white box stoves. So it works on pressurizing the alcohol that's uh, that's in the container um, alcohol goes in the middle there obviously enough of a puddle light the uh, light the meths and once it heats up uh, again it blooms around the jets around the outside here you can see from the marks there that it's successfully done that and then you put your pot directly on top once again just like the white box and that uh, then pressurizes the alcohol and gets the most out of it. But, um, and I, oh yes, I do think on this one as well, he's done it just like he has with the triad. And I don't think I mentioned that with the triad, that when you've got alcohol left in there, you can actually lift it up and drizzle the alcohol down the legs, back into your bottle. And the same goes for this one as well. You can lift it up and drizzle the alcohol back down into the bottle, obviously when it's cold. Evanue. Now, Japanese firm um, had dealings with them a few few years ago, and they've come and gone and changed a few things. But basically, their little Evanue meth burner is uh, very. Uh, what's the word? Has lots of different ways you can use it. Probably the best way of putting it. So as as it stands in that format, you can put the alcohol in the centre, light it, and both jets both holes will, once it's vaporized, will jet out the flame. Now, I think most people that have used it will agree that it's a fairly thirsty burner, but uh, again, it's got the appeal of alcohol burners in the sense that it's silent and does the job. But Evanue took it a stage further and they brought out a stand for it and uh, it's in the middle of the picture, which is here somewhere, and a trivet. So if I look it sideways on, so the alcohol burner goes in the bottom. So you've got your alcohol burner there. You have your base here. Um, depending on how you use it, this is a thing called an afterburner. You drop your alcohol in stove in there. You then have the upper section, which sits on top of there. The afterburner goes in there. And what that does is heats up from the flames from beneath obviously, and then burns any wasted or missed fuel as it were. And the pot can go on top, but it's more efficient if you use their trivet and it goes on top of there. 
The other way that it can be used is you have your alcohol burner there and your trivet sits on top like that. And that then gives you just enough height above the burners to have a very simple stove. Now, I've also designed a trivet which is a bit more flexible. So it fits on the avenue, but as you'll see in a while, it also fits on a lot of other things as well. And it's also lighter than theirs. But the stove is 36 grams. And the rest of it with the trivet is what, 74 grams. So 110 grams and you've got yourself a, a burner, a windshield, and then the final thing that this burner does offer you is, uh, here we go, the final thing this burner does offer you is a wood burning stove. So pop the base in, he says fingers and thumbs tonight. Pop that in the top and if you need it you could have the trivet as well and there's the idea that you have a little wood burning stove. Does it work? Yes. Does it work very well? No. But it's nice and you have that option for 110 grams. So for 110 grams you have a you have a meth burner, alcohol burner, you have a uh, and it's also you can use an Esbit tablet in there as well by moving that tray around esbit burner and you've got a wood stove as well and a trivet chucked in so um yeah interesting design and typically japanese in the sense that it's very nicely made um, let's move on to that one this is a well who doesn't recognize one of these if you've ever been to an army surplus or you're a boy scout or in the cadets or something you will have seen this or if you're in the military you probably have a bigger butcher version in the military but the principles very very simple Closes up, you have all your Esbit tablets inside, or hexamine tablets. You lift it up to put the pot on, you set fire to your hexamine, as you can see I've done there, and allegedly your food will be warm. Uh, but as I say, I've not had the greatest success with hexamine. People have used these for little wood burning stoves as well, um, but they're very much like the, the Avenue. They work, but you know, not particularly effective. And if you wanted a weight on that, as a comparison, what are we talking, 86 grams? How are we doing so far with the chat? Anybody else interested in um, any questions coming through, Rose? Shropshire lad says, when's the coffee ready? <laughs> he just wanted a coffee. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, just uh, Thomas um, on Facebook says that uh, he ranks the Vargo stoves are going to be the, the, the collector's pieces of the future. Oh, really? Okay. Um, right. Let's just look at this one as a slightly different uh, thing, which is a folding windshield and pot stand. So it's not a burner as such, but I think it comes with a burner. Let's just flip over to the website. Um, this is from Speedster Stoves. And this particular one I've got is the combined windscreen and pot rest for an MSR Titan kettle. Uh, so, as you can see there, it's got uh, a little stand or three little prongs and it all hinges together with this pin that pulls out and so the whole thing, once it collapses down, sweetly collapses away like that, which is quite nifty. Certainly for, what is it, 15 quid? Bargain. And so you pin it together and that's where this is where it's a bit fiddly so if your hands are cold or your eyesight's not very good i've got my glasses on tonight that can be a bit of a problem and then you presumably i'm not too sure whether they've got a burner i'm guessing they have they would have a burner inside there as well there's a titan kettle pot and that sits on there and away you go so quite nifty i think actually for uh, for what it is for the sort of money we're talking about so that's speeds to stove sort of windshield come pot support. Let's put that one out of the way. And fold that up there. As I say, the, um, the, the trivet that I designed, I tried to make it so it worked with a lot of things. So that's it sitting on a, a Trangia. Uh, so if you want the simplest possible burn that's going to last for a long time, the Trangia stove obviously is a, is a heavy beast. 
at all of 66 grams if you're into the lightweight. Uh, however, it's a great burner and I've had it burning for 18 to 20 minutes, which is the longest burn I think I've had on any alcohol stove. So obviously you can't control it when it's got a trivet on it like that, but it works quite well as a way of uh, just gently heating your food through and all you need is a windshield, if that at all. So that works quite well. So I'll put that to one side. Um, any other comments and questions coming through? Speedsters have burners. Yes, they, I know they do. I've looked on the website. They've got a whole range of stuff. Um, but it was just so that's all I had, um, Philip, with, with me. So I, I just thought that would be um, a talking point. Then we go on to, we'll come on to Norman's in a second. So this is the bog standard Caldera cone. And a very simple, effective uh, cone shape. It just unclips and rolls up. It's extremely effective, it's very, very light, and it's also extremely sharp as well. Uh, what did I put the container? The, it's just a little bit of a fiddle. When it's, if it's been sitting in your pack and the aluminium gets bent, it can be a bit of a fiddle. Now, I don't know what they're doing these days, but when I picked this one up, it came in a plastic Coca-Cola cup for storage inside the pack, which I, I didn't think was particularly practical. The burner, a uh, very light burner here. Let's have a look at the weight on that. So the burner's 16 grams, and the cone on top takes it up to 54 grams. But as you'll uh, sure you'll agree, I could just squeeze this burner and it'll just collapse. Um, so as much as it's effective and it does the job, and it does the job exceedingly well, I know Chris Townsend's quite a fan of, I believe, Caldera cones or certainly the, the principle of the way they work. Um, I just wouldn't trust this uh, camping. I'd be too clumsy and uh, I'm liable to crush it. But very effective concept and design all the same. So let's just pop that one out of the way, he says. Right, Stormin Norman. Now, Stormin Norman is actually in the chat room um, at this very moment, so he's obviously going to be very interested about what I'm going to say, and also he will be there to answer any questions if people are interested in these. Now, Stormin, these are the two you sent me about a year or so ago, so I don't know if anything has changed as regards design, but uh, please correct me if I am wrong. Now, Stormin's stoves are called the Stormin Cone and the Pot Hugger. So let's have a look at the cone first. This is the one for the MSR, Titan Kettle once again. And it comes with a burner and sensibly, thank you Norman, it's in a protected plastic container. So that certainly helps with the looking after the stove and not standing on it. It also provides this nifty little clip. So there's your burner and your burner comes in at 12 grams. There's your simmering ring on top, takes up to 14 grams. Put it inside the container, 28 grams. And then the cone, which I'll take apart in a second, another goes 68 grams. And then you have a base plate as well. So you're looking at 88 grams all in on that one. But nicely done, Norman. I have to give you um, full credit for the, the finish on it. The finish, by comparison, is something like the Caldera. Or, and as I say, that is an old Caldera, so maybe I'm being unfair. But it's, a, it's nowhere near as sharp around the edges, which is a great relief when you've got lots of expensive high-tech fabric inside your bag. Base plate, which works a treat. And then the cone section itself all comes apart like this and slides apart like that. And I think I'm right in saying it will all sit inside the appropriate pot. I did it a bit, a bit tighter with the burner and probably that as well. Am I right with that, Norman? That doesn't fit in there, does it? No. Anything I've missed on that, Norman? Let's have a quick look at the chat room. Um, so that's the, that's the uh, cone, the St Stormin' Norman's cone. And then we have Stormin' Norman's 
um, pot hugger, and this is for the Tokes 1100, whoops, 1100 pot. So, as you can see, well used and loved, and dirty inside. Um, similar sort of principle, let's just pop it on the scales for the complete weight. 84 grams, so two grams lighter than the, uh, the other one. And the way this one works is that if you, oh, you can see it from there. So we have the burner, same principle again. There's your burner, there's your simmering ring. So your burner goes in the bottom like that. Uh, you have your base plate to uh, reflect the heat up, which is quite good. And then you have the pot supports which are two little nicely finished off metal pot supports with a lovely little protected handle so you don't burn your little fingers. And that all slides together like that, it sits on top of there, pan goes in there, sit back, enjoy the view, and wait for, wait for supper. And once again, designed in such a way that it will all come apart and slide apart like that and roll down to sit inside the pan and I think the base plate will go in this one. Maybe I've got the base, base plates the wrong way around actually Norman, thinking about it. Maybe that one goes in there. No, no I haven't. So base plate in there and then you've got the heater and your supports as well, which is very good. How's the chat room looking, Rose? Any comments coming through? Uh, yeah, Norman says that uh, the design, designs have been refined for all windshields, aluminium and titanium. Thanks, Norman. I knew there would be something I'd probably missed on that score. Um, so is there, before I put these alcohol stoves away, any other questions? Anybody want to uh, make any comments or see anything else again or in close-up detail? Um, Nothing I can see there. Philip, speeds to have burners. Yeah, thanks, Philip. Um, Monty Adventures, I use my cone daily for a brew, it's great. Oots and Boots, he likes the speedster, flat, uh, flat packer, which is good, and obviously Norman's comment as well. Uh, Joss, what's Joss saying? Hi, Joss, nice to see you again, and seen one of too many hexy burn. Yes, of course, you're ex-military, aren't you? So yes, you would have seen far too many of those. Okay, well, let's move on to the gas. I'm just going to flip over to the wider camera rows. If you got any comments or anything you wanted to add there, or I'll put this down. Kevin's asking what's the burn time, but I'm not sure which, 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 stove, one he, which stove he's referring to. Right, so let's pull back a bit. Now, not the, uh, the biggest selection of gas stoves, but stoves that I've used and uh, can comment on with confidence. Has to go back to this is a basic, bog standard, basic, chunky Duke of Edinburgh stove. One, probably one of the first stoves I bought, best part of 20 years ago. Um, still use it today for, you know, camping, doing, having a picnic in the garden or whatever else it may be. Dead simple, portable hose, slides onto the, the gas container, fire it up and away it goes. No frills, no fuss, and the adjusters on the, the end here. And I should imagine in this day and age, it's probably exceedingly heavy. Way, almost half a kilo, 370 grams. Then... We, let's put that to one side. Uh, another one that's car camping when we do occasional trade shows or whatever it may be. Uh, we don't fiddle with the, the, nice, the uh, nice lightweight stuff. We just whack in a bog standard burner, which is dead easy and always works. And this is the Covia or one of Covia's uh, brand. Um, again, heavy duty, chunky, um, but great for car camping and just not messing about really, 300 grams so no nothing no frills about that one um then we start talking a bit sexier and far more expensive that's the nova octopus nova plus which is a beast and a half and it really does look like it's going to go 
go right, go up the mountains on its own. It really is a look at that in black. It's the stove in black. Multi fuel stove. Um, you can basically give it everything and it will burn. Uh, this is for proper expedition sort of stuff, really. It's definitely not, doesn't fit the lightweight category. And the, I don't know if it's this one or there's the Nova and the Nova Plus, uh, but one of them uh, comes apart and goes inside a Trangia adapter, which actually makes it quite good to stick inside a Trangia cook set or the honey stove or anything else that takes a Trangia fitting. And that will um, obviously provide maximum output for, uh, for whatever fuel you can lay your hands on. The other one that's a bit more heavy duty, but definitely lighter. Let's just weigh that one just for out of curiosity. It's going to be probably about four or 500 grams, isn't it? Oh no, 290 grams is quite respectable, isn't it? The MSR, uh, which one's this? Is the MSR Wind Pro. Let's pop that on there. Um, again, a very pokey uh, gas stove, 188 grams. And this, is, this one comes with uh, a plastic support here for the gas canister. So the gas canister can be inverted and it's got a preheater, uh, let's turn it around so you can see it, preheater pipe here as well. So as the gas goes through, it's getting preheated before it goes into the burner head and ignites. Uh, so it makes it an extremely efficient winter gas stove. Uh, very, very popular and obviously with a braided uh, metal braided hose pipe as well, nice and sturdy, and you can rely on this on, on most occasions, which, uh, which is important. Um, I'll come on to something in a second, actually. It's one of the other stoves that it happened to me, but it's, it's interesting that it hasn't happened on any other stoves. So that's, that's been a particularly good stove. The, the interesting one that I, um, I quite like for certain novelty value is this Optimus Crux. Uh, we've used uh, an Optimus Crux on um, various adventure races and it's proved to be an absolute belter of a stove. Uh, it's got a swivel head on it, but this design is designed to sit, it comes in a little um, neoprene pouch, but it's designed to sit in the curve of the gas canister. So in actual fact, as you can see there, just at that angle, it hardly takes up any space at all so it will hide in the base of a gas canister um, uh, one of the big ones like this or the the 250 gas canister uh, and then it's got the the swivel head which is quite nice so it's unswivels and locks there's a good good clip on that locking it mechanism so make sure it doesn't wobble and then the fins pop out and so does the gas adjuster and uh, where are we there we go uh, and away you go so it's a, it's a super little stove, great output performance as well, um, as most small stoves are these days. And then to fold it down, you just pull that recess down, flip the lid over, and away you go. It's locked away and you put it on the bottom of the gas canister, which is a uh, very nifty design, very nice nifty design that. This is uh, the Nat, uh, the Nat stove, which is, you can see, got a similar sort of size burner head. Um, it was, the company that made this was in Korea and what happened, they sub the design or allowed people to brand this design. So numerous people have used this stove, changed the color of the base there and uh, called it their own brand, their own product. Uh, I think in America it was called something like the Montagnu or Montignu uh, Nat stove, but generally it was known as the Nat around, uh, around the outdoors world. The problem I had was actually with this stove, and I found it was quite interesting. The, I don't think you can see it there, you can just make it out on the screen. See that little rubber ring inside the base there? Um, I found that I had a couple of these, and the rubber ring perished or split very easily when I put it onto the gas canister. And I've just noticed that obviously the same rubber ring principle is on, that's the MSR stove, and uh, there's the Trangia stove. I haven't come onto the Trangia burner yet. Uh, so I was just disappointed that the ring went, the O-ring, and I couldn't seem to find a replacement anywhere. Um, but it was okay, it was okay, it was certainly light. But uh, as you can see from the sort of shape of it, it's not the easiest thing to pack. Um, it just takes up, if small compact stoves are important to you, it takes up a, a fair amount of space. Um, coming on to, I'll do the Trangia at the end, uh, coming on to smaller compact stoves, 
Fargo stove was a bread and butter stove for a lot of people actually from about 2007, 2008 onwards. Uh, a lot of people were, were fans of the Vargo stove and at the time I don't think the pocket rocket was available so this really was one of the very few titanium head stoves that uh, you could get on the marketplace. Uh, weight wise these days I suppose 82 grams is, is quite a lot but uh, popular, uh, very simple, just flip the heads out and uh, fired it up and away you went. The only negative to this was a lot of people would say that because the head was uh, on a swivel basis, the slightest nudge with the pan and you could knock it at a place like that and all of a sudden your food would, would fall over, which was the, uh, the only complaint really about these. But these stoves still sell well, they're great stoves, nothing wrong with them, you just gotta be very careful and pay attention to, to the fins. And Likewise with this one, which is a Mark Hill stove, uh, which uh, actually this is, this is our favorite stove. It may not be the lightest one in the world. What are we talking about? 94 grams, no, it's not the lightest one in the world. But um, I just always liked the features. Very similar to the Vargo stove, it's got a slightly wider fin spread, which is good and obviously makes you feel a bit more confident with the bigger pans. Has the same issues as regards, you've just got to make sure you don't catch that fin when you're putting the pan back on, otherwise your pan will fall off. Um, and it's got a, a igniter, piezo igniter on it as well, uh, which I've never had fail on me in the 12, 13 years I've, I've had it. Um, so it's one of those, that's the first stove that we'll pick up uh, for sort of general camping. And then if we're adventure racing, we'd probably go for the crux stove or something similar. Uh, a couple of folks want to know the weight of the crux stove, please. The weight of the crux stove, sure. Um, the crux stove is 90 grams. Uh, finally, we've got the, the Trangia burner head. Uh, again, I just uh, picked this up to make sure it fitted the uh, design that I put on to the honey stove because it's got a Trangia adapter in it and to make sure it worked well, which it did. And it worked. Um, it's just nice to know that when I do have different stoves, which I may come on to that I've got Trangia fittings, uh, just to double check that a Trangia um, uh, alcohol stove and also the gas head will fit in there as well. Uh, but again, very simple, very effective, uh, uh, similar to the MSR with the braided, uh, braided pipe and uh, the adjustment at the end. No piezo ignition, but manual ignition and away you go. So a nice bog standard, bog standard stove. Right, I think I'm just going to have a break for a second and uh, tell you what's going on this week. Uh, and we'll come back to my favourite wood burning stoves just before you do that coming you on the live streams next week on monday we delve into my huge collection of alcohol gas and wood stoves gathered over the last 20 years to see how things have changed one for stove nerds like me then on wednesday david linton joins us to discuss his new the big rounds book just published by cicerone press which is an inspiration and guide on how to tackle the bob graham Paddy Buckley and Charlie Ramsey rounds. We'll also be doing a live giveaway to win a copy during the show. Then on Friday, Lisa Cutcliffe from Edulous Wild Foods joins us to help identify plants and edibles we might now see during our daily constitutional walk during these next few weeks. She may even show us how to use and cook them too. You can stream all of this, of course, over on Facebook or YouTube. And you can join in with the chat room live during the show to ask questions. If you're currently bored, of course, don't forget The Outdoor Station is the longest running podcast in the world. And we have over 500 podcasts to help you pass a few hours, which can be found in all these usual places. So that's Bob's Stove Collection on Monday. David Linton on Wednesday and Lisa Cutcliffe on Friday, all at 7 p.m. Make sure you click the reminder icon on your chosen platform.
Um, that's better. Sorry about that, folks. Thanks for reminding me. Right, I'll go through that again. The um, question was, uh, what are my thoughts on uh, transferring gas between canisters? Um, the, I've seen people promoting and buying the adapters from AliExpress at the moment. And my concern is that if you've got a canister that's 80% and another canister that's 20%, surely they're going to meet halfway through. They're just going to balance each other out. They're not actually going to transfer the full amount of the 20% into the 80%. It just doesn't work for me logically. Also, when I've seen people do it and I've been witnessed it once, it looked like a very dangerous pastime and certainly something I wouldn't want to do inside a tent or, uh, or uh, anywhere where there was flammable uh, material. Um, it did make me feel a bit nervous. Anything to do with that sort of thing makes me feel a bit nervous. But that would be my comments on it. Um, whether it agrees with other people, I don't know. But I've yet to experience doing it myself safely. Uh, and the only other one was that obviously that you didn't... The other way. Obviously you didn't mention the jet boil. Uh, no, I haven't. I, so I, I sold my jet boil. Um, otherwise I would have mentioned it. Um, it's, the jet boil is a very effective boiler and it is exactly what it's supposed to does what it's supposed to do on the tin as it were um the the biggest thing about jet boil is you you can't cook on it or cook in it but now they've brought out various adapters that you can cook with it um what we tend to advise the people who've got a jet boil who like the jet boil is to invest in pot cozy material because the cozy that comes with the jet boil the neoprene isn't particularly good from a cozy point of view if you want to boil the water and then add your dehydrated food to the jet boil after it's boiled and then put it in a pot cozy that would be the way to do it to save pots and pans uh, but it's a yeah very effective tool very efficient um, obviously a bit on the heavy side if you're looking at the stove alone from a stove weight point of view but if that's okay with everybody i'll move on to the sort of the wood burning side of things now it's starting to um, it's starting to to get busy and i've got two more trays of these I was going to say, a lot of people are really looking forward to the wood burners. Are they? Oh, excellent. Okay, well, let the fun begin. Where do we begin? Where do we begin? Uh, I suppose the smallest one would be this from Bushcraft Essentials. Um, uh, would you believe called the pocket stove? Now, we'll come on to the subject of the pocket stove in a while because it's something that has wrangled me slightly. Uh, but this is, uh, comes apart not very nice and easily. Uh, obviously, you can put the, uh, a wood burner in there. Sorry, you can put a transier or a alcohol burner in there. And you can obviously put a wood... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Environment, uh, the, the burn, fuel that burn, whatever the word is, uh, inside as well. Um, 68 grams and the whole thing just pings apart nicely. And the, the edges aren't too sharp. Uh, and it's, it's got an adjustable base, so you can adjust the base. The top is just all pings apart, which is, he says, uh, I did one earlier on when I did it. And you've got to be careful you don't bend it, as you can see. There we go. So, uh, yeah, so that's the Bushcraft Essentials pocket stove. Um, I need to turn all this around. I've got too much on the desk. The... The Vargo hexagon stove might be the next one, really. As you can see, I've used this one quite uh, extensively. Again, Brian Vargo, nice little design. The whole thing is all hinged and folds down flat like that. Available in titanium, which is this, uh, weighing in at 120 grams and also available in stainless steel. Um, I have got one, but I didn't bring it out which is obviously going to be proportionately heavier. Couldn't be simpler, really. It just all folds, sorry, hinges round the base plate and slots together. My only question with hinged wood burning stoves, uh, and it's a sort of a positive and a negative. A lot of people want the ease of items being connected and being hinged, which I understand. But as you can see there, I was struggling to twist the pins. Sometimes the pins, because the pins inside these hinges aren't titanium, they're stainless steel. And what tends to happen is they will uh, rust over time or get uh, corroded in some way. And sometimes once the pin breaks, then obviously the whole thing falls apart. So that is the negative to anything that's hinged. 
But uh, this is what well, I don't know, this is probably well over 10 years old, this one, and I've used it a fair few, few times, and it's very effective and does the job nicely. Uh, another one from Brian is the folding grill. Uh, this is the titanium version. Uh, again, it comes in uh, two flavours, titanium and stainless, uh, 282 grams. And again, nicely designed, folds, folds down. Where is the pin? There's a pin that unclips somewhere, that just there, he says. Uh, huh. You can see I haven't done this for a while. It is live after all, as the pin's tight, that's what it is. There we go. So, it will fold. I will make it fold. There you go, it will fold. So for a portable barbecue type of situation, uh, you've got a nice little concept there. Great, great idea. Um, sharp edges, a few sharp edges to, to be aware of. I'd, I'd call that more a social type burner really rather than a sort of a lightweight backpacking one but um, each to their own, each to their own, good one. Um, then we have obviously, I'm going to mention the honey stove uh, because I made it, I designed it. And now we've, we designed the honey stove, a bit of history on this actually. In 2005, 2006, you couldn't really buy a wood-burning stove in the UK. The only things you could buy, in fact, it's the one that somebody asked me about earlier on, let me bear with me a second because it's underneath the desk, was this one. This beast, absolute beast. Half a kilo, 570 grams. This was made, I believe, for the Israeli army. And the concept's very simple, very similar to, to Brian Vargo's in, in actual fact. I'm um, just trying to remember how it comes apart now. It all folds down into a flat chunk like that. As you can see, it's well used. So that was my first, one of my first wood burning stoves that I was able to get hold of to see what the wood burning stove market was like while I was kicking around the idea of the, the honey stove. Um, and as I say, coming in at, at almost 600 grams, it was a, a bit too heavy duty, but extremely popular. And for many years, the bushcraft market were, were in love with this, which is understandable. I mean, it is bulletproof. It is designed for the military. So, um, so that was one of the reasons that I started looking at doing the honey stove. Uh, there was another one that was available, uh, which again, I think is underneath. Um, no, it isn't. Which is this one, which I believe was designed for the Swiss Army. And typically military stuff. I don't know if Joss, you can confirm that, but you've got your sort of your billy. It usually came with a, an alcohol burner at the bottom. And there's a little fold-out stand there, which is hinged. And then your pot would sit in there like that, and away you would go. I think it came with an alcohol burner, but also obviously you could put wood in, the, wood in that as well. But I think at the time, in 2005, 2006, 2007, there wasn't much to, to buy on the wood-burning stove front. Um, the only other one, oh, makes so much noise these things. Let's get rid of that. The only other one was the Bush Buddy, but we'll come on to the Bush Buddy in a moment. Um, I won't come on to those just until a second. So anyway, honey stove, yeah, along came the honey stove and, um, I'm gonna blow my own trumpet, but when we launched this, we launched it and it was the only one in the world that promoted the fact that it was organic matter, it was esbit, it was alcohol stove friendly, and it was also gas adapter friendly. And coming back to the Transia gas adapter that I mentioned earlier on. So the Transia plate would take a, a Transia burner, 
or any Trangia type of gas burner or gas adapter, multi-fuel adapter, and the stove was born and uh, has been very successful ever since. Again, a lot of people, as I say, have complained the fact that it's not hinged, and I explained to, uh, to you the reason why. That's one reason. The other reason why is trying to get somebody in the UK to make a hinged item is impossible. And of course, it is UK made, 208 grams, and uh, it's made five miles away from here. So um, I'm very pleased with that, the way, the way that's performed. Anyway, but that gives you the chance to have a hexagonal stove, or you can just use four sides or three sides and a door and have a square stove. But that's for some other time. Then we've got the M kettle. Now, for people who like Kelly kettles, um, this is a baby version, really. That's all I can say about this. What we're looking at, we're looking at uh, 434 grams. And this was sort of partly initially designed for the cycling market, would you believe? And I've seen many pictures. The bag that it actually comes in had a couple of calipers on it so you could clip it to the crossbar on a, on a cycle. So if you wanted to have a brew while you're out, then you have your, you have your base, burner base here. You put your, your pot on top. Obviously take the bung out. You put your liquid inside there. I think it'll take about, uh, takes about a, is it a litre or half a litre this rose? I think it's half a litre. Probably a bit more than that actually. Uh, and then you set fire to your, uh, to your organic matter and away it goes. And then on top of that, should you wish to do it, then you can pick up one of the, I put it down somewhere, I put it down there. Pick up one of the trivets that we designed and that will sit on top so you can have a pan on top should you wish. Or if you want to have something burning away and have a pan support there, you've got a pan support there using the um, trivet. But for what it is, these things are generally huge, as most people will probably know. The bushcraft mar market like these, people working generally outdoors like these, because it's so simple and it takes very, very little material to burn and get a pint of water boiling away. So they're, they're nice and they're unique. I guess the only ones you can get in this country is, uh, is the M kettle, which is that small. Then we'll come on to this beast, the quick fire. Not necessarily a stove as such, more a grill and support, but this is made in uh, Devon, I believe, to a chap in Devon. Nice and chunky, ideal for the bushcraft market who uh, want something that's going to be effective and not warp in the, in the heat. And it comes with a groovy little fork here, which is for taking the top grill off or for lifting it up. Whereas the two holes, the two holes there for lifting it up and uh, taking it apart and the whole thing just unclips like a big trivet and that's quite cool. Right now we're coming on to my little little pet hate, pet concern. Right can I do this? Yes I can do this. Okay oh dear. Right that's a good example of what it's like. Let's just put that back together again. Okay so one two three four five and the other one's missing as well. Oh, it's there. So back in 2008, 2009, I designed the pocket stove. And the, let's see if we can just do this from the other angle. Can we see the shapes of these? Now, can you work out which is the original? So there you go. Which one is the original? Because they've all come from my design. So my design is this one. And you can pick it up, you can move it around, and it's designed obviously to be a wood burning stove, an Esbit stove, and a great little windshield support for a Tranger. Works well with the Tranger and Esbit. As a wood burner, it's a bit like the Avenue one. You can do it, but you've got to keep feeding material into it. Um, but it's not surprising really considering the actual amount of air volume that gets through there. It's very uh, very hard to keep a really high heat flowing as easy as it is in the, in the honey stove for example. Then somebody in the UK decided to call, make another one and uh, strange enough called it the, the pocket stove which um, was okay until you actually tried to pick it up and uh, wasn't particularly successful. Then Bush 
Craft Essentials had another one. Obviously, that's their design is, is different, but they called it the pocket stove, which adds to the confusion. Then Lixada, this is their alcohol um, and Esbit stove support, which goes inside, decided to make one as well and call it the pocket stove. This one was hinged, which is, appeals to people, but of course, it's considerably cheaper than the original, which is um, one of those things. <clears throat> and then somebody else in AliExpress decided to make a bigger one. They didn't call this the pocket stove, unless they've got very big pockets there. But this is an absolute nightmare. You touch it and breathe on it, and it just falls apart. It's just... So if you had a fire going, and your food was sitting on top of that, the slightest nudge of that, and it falls apart, which is very frustrating. But they're all called the pocket stove. And my little gripe is the fact that if somebody slates the fact they bought a pocket stove and it was rubbish, who knows which pocket stove it was. Uh, and also from a, a design stroke copyright point of view, it just wrangles a bit that uh, Lixada have sold thousands of their stoves and uh, we don't get any credit for it. But that's just the way of the world, unfortunately, these days. Now, let's get on to wood gas stoves, which is, I'm sure, people are waiting desperately for. Yes, somebody's saying wood gas. Oh, right. Any comments there, Rose, while I'm moving this around? Well, uh, Cheshire Wonder says he uses the Lixada with the alcohol stove and it works well. <laughs> Wash his mouth out, I say. <laughs> okay, anybody else? No, I think the uh, firebox. Is the firebox coming up? Uh, no, I haven't got a firebox, so that won't be mentioned, I'm afraid. But as I say, these are ones that I've picked up and either used myself or have, uh, have wanted to take a closer look at. So, wood gas. Wood gasification. There's a story here, again, back to, um, back to original design and things being copied, I guess. Now, let's get the right order. This one was the first one. So let's just zoom into that a bit. So this is the original inverted downdraft wood gasifier, the Bush Buddy, designed by uh, Fritz Handel in Canada. Interesting chap. And uh, his design, the Bush Buddy Ultra, because he's part of his uh, writing there. It is beautifully made. That's very, the spot welding on this titanium is fantastic. And the actual science, the way it was all balanced out uh, inside there is something to behold. Uh, I will show you the inside of a similar stove shortly. But if you're interested in knowing more about Fritz, because he's an interesting character, um, have a look over on Hiking in Finland's uh, website. There's an interview there with Fritz Handel, um, which is quite interesting, done by... Um, Hendrick. Anyway, back to that. So that was the, the Bush Buddy, which I think came out 2008, 2009, possibly slightly earlier, about 2008, I think. Um, and uh, I, I contacted him to try and get these over, made in the U not made in the UK, but brought into the UK, but he wasn't set up for commercial business. And he sort of came and went, really. Um, then a company in Poland started copying them and created a thing called the Bush Cooker, which as you can see is very similar in the design. Uh, it wasn't as well finished and well made, and unfortunately they did at times use cheap components, uh, and within a short period of time some of it used to fall apart, which was a bit disappointing. So they sort of came and went in a year or so. Um, again, the Bush Buddy continued selling in its in its uh, steady amounts. And then the solo stove came along and pinched the design for the Bush Buddy and created one which was heavier duty and to be fair, very well made and equally as efficient. But to look at it, the only difference appears to be the, the top. But to give you an idea of the, the weights we're talking about, the original Bush Buddy was 140 grams. The Bush Cooker, 196 grams, and the solo stove, 258 grams. So as much as it was a tougher stove and um, made with thicker material and probably made much, made much more commercially on a commercial basis as opposed to an individually craftsman basis, uh, you're paying the penalty of, of the weight. 
Now, um, there's obviously the, um, the bigger version as well, which is their, their Titan. So that's their Titan stove. And, and I think now they do a whole range of much, much bigger stoves for uh, families and barbecues and that sort of things. But if you're interested, I've taken one apart, cut one open. Do you want to see inside it? Does people want to see inside it? Say in the chat room if you do want to see inside it, because I will, I'll, uh, I'll show you it broken apart. It might be worth just going over to how, um, how they work, you know, if people aren't aware of what the difference is with gas wood stoves. Yeah, okay. Um, well, that's why I was, I'd taken one apart, actually. Let's, um, let's see if I can break it down for you. Move these out of the way. Right. That's the area we're working on. Okay, let's move that out of the way. Okay, so wood gasification. Let's get the lid out of the way. So to the initial view, looking at it first time round, you can see there's holes in the side there and holes around the inner rim here. So theoretically you think, ah, oh, the air's coming in here and uh, it's going through there. And that's how one would assume it to be but it's not strictly that simple because what happens is is the air comes in is drawn in through the base as you can see ben behind these holes there is a solid wall so how is the air getting in to the base of the fire because obviously in the grill there there needs to be air for the organic matter to ignite so that's the first thing. The second thing that happens is when that is ignited and the fire is going, it's then heating this, this um, cylinder and the air gap between the inside and the outside of the cylinder is heating up the air. So what happens is, is the, some air comes into the bottom for the fire grate and the other air, as it were, that comes up the side is heated up and then mixes with the gases that's in the top and does a secondary burn. So you have two burns and when this is going, you get a natural fire in the bottom there and then you see a jet of blue flames all around the top of this, which makes it a super effective burner. It's a very, very good design. Anyway, so when it's cut apart, it looks like this. So that's the upper section to the grill, which forms that much of the depth. Then the lower section, is here. So the air, that's the lowest part, the air comes through there. Those bits were welded into here. So the air comes in at the bottom, comes up the side, then into the top of there, which is sitting underneath that. So even in a high wind, the wind is not going to blow out your fire because it's got three angles for it to go through. So it comes in the side at the bottom, goes up a bit, goes across, and then goes up a, a, up a bit again. And then the remaining air that's in the channel between the inside and the outside then gets heated up by the fire that's inside there and reignites through these holes at the top. So it's quite a complicated little process and I'm sure you can appreciate the work that must have gone into designing that. And in fact, that article I pointed out to you on Henrik's site um, is actually got all the um, prototypes that he went through as well to actually design it because the there's the the practical part of actually putting this together as an item but there's also the scientific part of you've got to balance the amount of air that's drawn through plus the um, amount of output you're getting so it doesn't burn the, the organic organic matter too quickly and you get maximum output so there's a lot of work that went into that so fair play to Fritz for for coming up with the original design and um, well I suppose you know to be fair solo stoves taking it and gone commercial with it as well, which is uh, understandable. Now, that is, uh, what was it called? It was called the Wood Gas Camp Stove LE. This is made in India, and this was had a very, very similar principle. Um, so you had a little battery pack here, which had a couple of um, double A's, I think it was, inside it. And in the bottom, can't really see anything, but in the bottom there's a fan, and it really is a cheap and nasty computer fan. And you just plug your, uh, your battery in, and a, a, the, the fan sucks the air 
through the sides and blows it up the top here and then, it then creates a vortex and once again the heated air the heated air that's come up the side is then reignited at the top and creates this very uh, powerful um, promoted gas wood gasification flame sorry i've got tongue-tied there so that one but i don't think you can get that anymore that i mean that, that's a brick that's a complete brick what is it 700 grams um, okay, folks, so then one more ga wood gasifier, which is, uh, this is called the Bush Cooker LE, I think. Uh, let me just find it for you. Um, this was, this is done by Four Dogs in America again. Uh, this is a wood gasifier, but on a very simple basis. So this is what it looks like in reality. So what we have here is you have a, a cone again with a jet type fan grill at the bottom. And the idea is that you put a bit, a bit of alcohol in there, put that on the base plate, put some organic matter inside there, light it. And once that then generates the heat, the air that's being compressed that comes up the side around this outer chamber will then reappear through this, the holes at the top and do exactly the same thing, reignite and away you go. Um, I've used it several times and never really got a successful burn out of it. Uh, so it's a, it's a nice novelty to have and it's not very heavy, it is titanium after all, um, which is 86 grams. Uh, so it's a bit of fun, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily say it was uh, the most effective burner of its kind. And then finally, have we still got people? I'm sorry, I haven't bored people too much have I, with all this. We've got a couple of questions and I seem to have lost the Facebook feed, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, Mark Jan Dalmans, uh, can you give us the link to the story for the gas stove? Yes, yeah, sure. If you go to hikinginfinland.com, uh, then uh, just uh, type in um, Fritz. I'm sure you'll find it in the search box there. No problem at all. Um, right, another Bushcraft Essentials, big hinged, heavy duty jobby. Uh, this, I think, is very similar to the firebox, uh, but it's definitely not a lightweight piece. This is more for bushcrafters who want to take the whole world with them, almost a kilo, 830 grams. Uh, and the top comes out. The two, it's got a base, where are we? It's got a grill there, as you can see. I'll do it that way. There's a grill at the top and a base plate so it protects the ground, all of which is hinged and folds away like that. And it's got a couple of trivets uh, that are clipped in here, which you can take out and put across the top as well. And then that's your grill plate across the top there. Uh, heavy duty stuff, much thicker uh, stainless steel than most of the other items that we've looked at. But again, it's something I collected and had a look at and uh, appreciate the, the work that's gone into it. But it's certainly not something I'd take camping. A bit of bushcraft fun, but, uh, but not camping as such. And then finally is the Ember Lit. Um, made in the USA. This is their, I think this is their standard size one. Um, trivet at the top to keep the, maintain the square shape. Um, this is pressed steel. Whereas the honey stove, for example, is laser cut. That's laser cut to order. This is pressed steel, so once you've got a stamp made or series of stamps made, you can stamp these out and consequently all the edges are actually not as sharp as, uh, as, as some uh, of the cheaper J uh, Chinese manufacturing uh, and it's a, it's a solid, reliable item. But weight-wise, again, not the lightest thing in the world, but 360 grams, fairly respectable, I guess, for, um, for, for this. Right, I think, have I gone through most of my stuff? I think I've gone through most of my stuff. So any particular questions people would like to, uh, like to ask? There's a, a question from uh, Ian McDonald, which is um, he, anything he needs to consider if he cooks in the acto foyer, you know. Um, uh, yeah, in the yeah. vestibule, yeah. Any, anything, special considerations, wood, wood burners. You're right, okay. Uh, Ian, I would, my, my suggestion was it would be don't do it. Um, Two reasons. First of all, obviously the real flames from organic matter are uh, uncontrollable and um, 
The Actos, like every other tent, are made from very nice flammable material, along with your insulation material probably wearing while you're lying on one elbow. Uh, it's certainly a sleeping bag, so that's one reason I wouldn't use a wood burner in the vestibule. And the other reason is carbon monoxide, not dioxide, monoxide. Uh, there have been a few deaths from people that have used a uh, disposable barbecue and had their meal and left it in the vestibule and obviously carbon monoxide sinks as opposed to rises so it's not particularly good for people who are lying down. That said, I have used the honey stove a couple of times in a vestibule type situation but um, what I did was I supported the door completely open and I had the stove out there so if it was, it was a good arm length away, if it decided to do anything I wasn't expecting or if for example uh, any of the organic matter around the outside of the stove started to catch I could literally just kick it away or throw some water on it. So that would be my comments on it. I, I prefer safety to, um, to risking having a wood burning stove inside a tent to be honest. And although that um, we're obviously looking at so the Lux Megahorn 3 now which has got the wood burning facility that obviously needs to be looked at in, in detail to, um, to talk that through from a safety point of view. Anybody else love? Uh, yes, um, Palin says, which meth stove do you personally prefer? Uh, well, it's a difficult one. It depends what mood I'm in, really. Uh, I think, I, think the, um, I like the Vargo Triad because of the simplicity and the weight of it, and also it clips together nicely, has got m m multiple ways you can use it, either put it in the ground or wrap it around um, uh, the honey stove or the pocket stove or one of the small stoves that it will sit inside. Uh, I like the white box because it's a super fast burner and if you want something to boil water very, very quickly, not something you cook on, boil water, it's very, very good if you, that's how you want to go. And to be honest, the, the, the old fashioned Tranger is such a bulletproof, practical, long-term item that sometimes, you know, when weight isn't necessarily the biggest issue, I just want a reliable burner that will always be there and works that way. I tend to go, I tend to go that way. However, having said that, in all fairness, Stormy Norman stoves are exceedingly effective and I'd, I would prefer to use those over the Caldera cone that I've got. As I say, it might, because it's an old one, it may be, it may be a bit sharp, but um, because he, his design packs away really nicely and it works exceedingly efficiently. So it depends what I'm doing. If I'm, there's, there's boiling water, there's heating food rapidly and there's cooking. There are three sort of different areas that you might want to consider when you are looking at any type of stove really. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. Um... Dave Fowler says, is the original Bush Buddy still for sale? Actually, Dave, yes, it is. Um, I found that out today. I thought Fritz had retired a long time ago, and he has. But he's actually, I think, sold the design to another company that are much more uh, commercial. And they're uh, distributing the, the Bush Buddy. You can get it from wildstoves.com. Unfortunately, wildstoves.com are closed at the moment because of COVID. But they have got some in stock uh, when I looked on their website and they're about £110 for the original Bush Buddy. Anybody else? Uh, no, I must apologise to Facebook if I haven't been uh, continuing the chat. I seem to have lost it and uh, can't seem to get it back at all. Not a technical whiz here, but um, do apologise to the people who are watching on Facebook. Right, OK, I think we've pretty well wrapped it up then. Oh, hi, Ginge. Nice to say hello to a few people that are in the chat room. So nice to see you, Ginge. Thanks for joining us. James Mears, uh, Mark Haydock, uh, Josh and Tinky Pete. Pete. Um, who else? Uh, Mark, uh, Pal Nielsen, Carlos. Uh, Carlos has put the link in the Facebook chat room if for hiking in Finland if you want to have that link to... Um, to Fritz. But I think that's pretty well it, folks. So thank you very much indeed for sticking with me for what, an hour and 15 minutes. So it's been a bit longer than I anticipated, but it has been 40 odd stoves. And I hope there's been some sort of interest in there uh, for you as well. So until next time, don't forget on Wednesday, uh, we've got uh, David Linton and we'll be giving one of his books away uh, during the show, uh, The Big Rounds, which is uh, fascinating. Great book, really good book. And also on Friday, we're talking to Lisa regarding wild foods 
and uh, what you can forage or you may see on your enforced walks during this isolation period. So until next time folks, take care out there. I hope it's been a good Easter for you. Look after yourselves and look after your loved ones. Bye for now.